everybody and welcome to our very special webinar. Um, we will be talking about this book, Weather, by Jenny Offal. Um, my name is Claudia, I'm from Friends of the Earth and I'm joined also by Oshin from Friends of the Earth here. And we are super excited to be celebrating World Environment Day with Sinead Gleeson, Irish writer and broadcaster, and Jenny Offal, all the way from New York, joining us online. This is very exciting for us to be able to to join on the other side of the ocean um, for this book club webinar. Um, so I'll hand over to you now, Sinead. Thank you, Claudia, and uh, thanks to Oshin, thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, I'm thrilled to be chairing this event with Jenny tonight. Um, a lot of people who know me will know that I was quite evangelical about Department of Speculation, a book I, I adored. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that book later on. But because we're here with Friends of the Earth Ireland and because this is World Environment Day and because lots of the themes in Jenny's new book deal with environmental and climate change issues, we're going to focus on some of those at the start and then we'll move towards Jenny's other work uh, and more generally look at maybe kind of craft and writing and leave some room for your questions at the end. So if we don't get to something or there's something you'd like to ask that isn't covered, um, do jump in at the end. So I'm just going to introduce, if you, if you don't know much about Jenny, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to, to who she is. Um, she's a writer and editor based uh, in New York. Um, she's the author of three books for adults and several books for children, including, including the aforementioned Department of Speculation, which was named one of 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Review of Books. It was also shortlisted for the Rathbones Folio Prize, the Penn Faulkner Award, and our very own International Dublin Literary Award. Um, she was also awarded a Guggenheim, very prestigious Guggenheim Fellowship in 2016. And her latest book that we're going to talk a lot about tonight is, is Weather, which was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction and has been called a broodingly intense ecstatic storm cloud of a book, which seems quite apt, as we, we, you'll find when we dig into it tonight. And it tells the story of Lizzie, who is a university librarian whose career takes quite a, an unexpected turn and there's all sorts of themes in this book it kind of looks inwards and it looks outwards um but i thought we we might start with the reading but before we do that um hello jenny um hey. and how, how are you doing in these very strange it was strange anyway in the pandemic and in the last week or so things in the us have gotten quite horrifying um how, how are you doing well um it's been it's been quite a spring i mean i feel sort of um each time you think things have fallen apart in one way, there seems to be a new way that's added. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty tough, tense time here in the States. Um, a lot of people um, who were already really suffering with the pandemic are also um, putting their lives at risk to protest right now. So it's a lot going on. Um, what are you going to read for us? I thought it'd be good to kind of set up the book in case people joining us are planning to read it or haven't read it yet. What, are you, what section are you going to read from? Um, I'm going to read from just a little ways in. Um, it's um, Lizzie, as you mentioned, is a librarian, but she also in the past um, had a dissertation that she abandoned and her former professor is now um, a podcaster who talks mostly about climate change issues and generally other uh, doomy topics. And uh, this is the lead up to her going to hear her for the first time since she hasn't seen her in a while. But it starts out in her in her home, um, and this is in uh, in the U.S. pre pre Trump election U.S. <clears throat> There's a sign on our elevator saying it is out of order. I stand there looking at it as if it might change. My neighbor, Mrs. Kavinsky, comes into the lobby. They'll let anyone be super now, she says. Anyone. I get the mail put off making my slow way up the stairs. The old preschool still sends us the newsletter. This one features a list of the top 10 fears reported by their students. Darkness doesn't make the cut. Blood, sharks, and loneliness are eight, nine, and 10. When I come in, the dog is sleeping under the table. My son, Eli, is folding a piece of plain white paper. Don't look, he says, I'm inventing this. No one will ever know what I've done except me. I don't look. I put up kibble and water, peer open-heartedly into the fridge. The window is open. It's nice out. There are some pots left over from last summer's tomato experiment. Whoosh, my son says. My number one fear 
is the acceleration of days. No such thing, supposedly. But I swear, I can feel it. Sunday morning, the dog has found a baby bunny in the grass. She closed her mouth around it once, then released it. Now we are trying to save it. Someone at the community garden has given us a box lined with a soft cloth, but it is trembling violently. There's no blood anywhere, but there are small indents in the fur that show where her teeth have been. We try to put it back in the garden, but it has already died. Of fright, I think. That night, Eli calls to us hysterically from the kitchen. There's a mouse skull under the sink, he says. I give my husband a dark look. We are killing them secretly, I thought. Heavily, he rises to go in there. He gets down on his knees to look under the sink, but it is only a knob of ginger, and we are saved. I don't know what to do about this car service man. He told me business is down, no one is calling anymore. He had to let all the drivers go and is down to one car. He sleeps at work now, so as never to miss a call. His wife has said she is going to leave him. Mr. Jimmy, that's the name on the card he gave me. I try to use only his service now, not the better, faster one. Sometimes when I call, his voice is groggy. He says always that he will be there in seven minutes, but it is much longer now. I used to take a car service only if I was going to be late, but now I find I am building in double the amount of travel time. A bus would be the same or faster. Also, I could afford it. But what if I'm the only customer he has left? And I'm late for the lecture now. I was wrong about what building it's in. By the time I get there, my old teacher, Sylvia, is almost through speaking. There's a big crowd. Behind her is a graph shaped like a hockey stick. What it means to be a good person, a moral person, is calculated differently in times of crisis than in ordinary circumstances, she says. She pulls up a slide of people having a picnic by a lake, blue skies, green trees, white people. Suppose you go out with some friends in the park to have a picnic. This act is, of course, morally neutral. But if you witness a group of children drowning in the lake and you continue to eat and chat, you have become monstrous. The moderator makes a gesture to show it is time to wrap up. A long line of men is forming behind the microphone. I have both a question and a comment, they say. A young woman stands up to wait in line. I watch as she inches forward. Finally, she makes it to the front to ask her question. How do you maintain your optimism? I can't even get to Sylvia afterward. There are too many people. I walk to the subway, trying to think about the world. Young person worry. What if nothing I do matters? Old person worry. What if everything I do does? Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, books have to start somewhere. Uh, and I'm thinking this week that a lot of us are having conversations that are necessary and that we are important to have at this time. And the, the idea for this book, you say, came out of conversations you had with a writer friend. How, how did those conversations go? What were they about? Um, well, one of my oldest friends, besides being a novelist, works for um, the Center for Biodiversity in Arizona, which is um, a really amazing environmental organization that uses the Endangered Species Act, um, has various lawsuits um, against the government, and has been um, really instrumental in, in saving a lot of land and a lot of um, species in America. And over the years, um, I would talk to Lydia about her work, as well as our usual things we talked about. And the news that she had just get, getting more and more dire. And um, I noticed at a certain point that I was sort of collecting these doomy facts, but um, also that they strangely weren't affecting me emotionally, that I was intellectually becoming more and more aware of the climate emergency as such. But the part where um, it was changing me in terms of what I felt wasn't happening. So part of what became a motivation for this book was I kind of wanted to write myself into feeling it. 
you said as well that you, you think of the book as, as a pre-apocalypse or uh, a phrase I really like, um, apocalypse adjacent. Uh, yeah. what, what did you mean by that? Well, I mean, I think that we probably most of us are familiar with the whole sort of genre of climate fiction, which is post-apocalyptic. And I mean, I think there's been a lot of really interesting work done um, with that. Um, but there's a way in which when everything is set in the future and it's set after basically after it's completely too late and after we've already um, gone into a collapse. Um, I just realized that that really wasn't the way I was thinking. I, I mean, to me, it felt very much like uh, it's like that old Neil, um, uh, Neil Stevenson quote where he says that the, the future's here. It's just not even, it's unevenly distributed. And I feel sort of that's the same about the apocalypse that it is here. Um, but it also is, um, not always apparent depending on how protected your life is. Mm -hmm. And so I kept thinking that I wanted to write a novel that um, was aware of the apocalypse, was aware of, of ideas of collapse, but wasn't existing um, in some future state. The, you've got involved with Extinction Rebellion and I know you've been to some events that have been organized by Dark Mountain. Um, could you tell, for people who don't know who they are, could you explain a little bit about who they are and what do you make of their approach to, to climate action? Well, one of the other really early um, catalysts, I think, for thinking about this novel was um, I read an article about Paul Kingsnorth um, and it was, it's I think it was in the New York yeah. Times. Yep. And, um, and it was, it had some sort of silly title like uh, it's the end of the world as he knows it, but he feels fine. <laughs> and it was about, um, how he'd, he'd written this essay for Orion um, saying that he had to walk away from the usual ways of, um, of activism that he'd been doing for years because he didn't believe in them anymore. And he talked about how he basically felt like a priest who no longer believed in God, but still stood up there every day and said uh, the same things. And he formed Dark Mountain as, um, as kind of a, well, it's very amorphous in a lot of ways, but as, as kind of a place for thought and for regrouping before new action, um, but also as a place to kind of tell the truth about how serious things had become. Um, those of us in environmental circles, you know, we all know that kind of uh, uplift that's tacked onto most environmental stories where we, we suddenly hear all the terrible news, but then at the end, there's, there's some kind of, but don't worry, you know, as long as we all do these things immediately, everyone at once, at, in huge number, everything will be okay. And um, he sort of said, no, I think, we, I think we have to, as various mystical traditions have always done, I think we have to have a dark retreat where we think for a while about what we should do next. So I went to one of their, um, one of their events with my friend Lydia um, that I was talking about earlier. Um, she was an excellent person to go with because having been in environmental groups for uh, many years, she had an unerring sense of when we were about to be forced into like a breakout group or it might become participatory. I'd be happily listening, thinking, oh, good, we're going to, you know, talk about soil erosion and I'm just going to not have to do anything but listen. And then suddenly we'd all have to turn to each other and tell our deepest um, thoughts. Um, and then in terms of Extinction Rebellion, um, I sent a little note of solidarity to the writer's version of that. Um, when they were protesting in London last year and, uh, and they said, oh, why don't you help organize one in the US? So that's been something that um, I've been doing with a few um, New York based writers is kind of figuring out. They share with uh, Dark Mountain that sort of sense of what happens if we tell the truth? What happens if we call it an emergency? Um, and we don't necessarily make trafficking and hope our only conversation, but just part of a bigger conversation. Yeah, something you said there reminded me of something that actually happens to Lizzie in the book, which is the idea that one of the problems we have around this issue is that a lot of people think that it's it's far away, way down the road, and that it's not going to affect them. But then, you know, Lizzie starts to think about dates and when the temperature will change and it will hit that kind of, you know, that point which you've talked about before. Um, is that part of the problem? The fact that people have not have still, still, even though it's that, you know, that idea of oh, the best time to plant a tree is, you know, today or whatever, 20 years ago, um, that people are still feeling that it's, it's, it's an intangible thing that won't happen in their lifetime. Therefore, I don't have to bother doing anything. 
I think it might be a combination of people. Um, you know, I think um, Rob Nixon came up with this very useful phrase, slow violence, to talk about um, something like climate change and various other um, things like forms of environmental racism and things like that. And I think that there's a sense that, um, you know, just when we see it in comparison with the response that we've all had collectively to the pandemic, where I think people felt it very viscerally, how dangerous it was. And climate change is often, it comes in kind of rolling disasters. And um, in certain parts of the West, people still feel relatively protected. I mean, it's going to come everywhere. There isn't going to be a place that's spared, even though the the billionaires think they'll be fine in New Zealand in their bolt holes. It's coming everywhere. But I do think that the um, the sense of it as kind of a slow moving and and a disaster that also comes in fits and starts has meant that people um, keep putting it aside. But also when they do look at it, um, they're just not sure what to do. It's 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 the philosopher Timothy Morton talks about climate change as like a hyper object that is so big that we can't get our minds around it. And I think that is part of what's going on too, that people are just overwhelmed at the scale of it. I, it's interesting that you mentioned the pandemic because there are both contradictions and parallels between the two, because I think if you look at say the, what's happening in the UK uh, at the moment with their numbers are, are quite insane and terrifying. And yet there's a very blithe attitude to opening things up again. And, and yet there is sometimes there's that fear of lack of action that if you say if you, if you act too soon, it's you're, you're panicking you're overreacting um, that's it. you'll feel a bit foolish later on because you did overreact and yet people kind of see covid as something that is an immediate threat and don't see climate change as an immediate threat well i remember though when um people were afraid to um to act about the pandemic as well i mean there was a long period where um I don't know, because I must have gotten some kind of reputation among my friends after this last novel as a doomer. I got lots of calls about whether or not people should or should not um, take this seriously, or should they um, leave New York if they were able? Should they do various things? Um, and I think that um, one of the things that's fascinating to me from the kind of forays I did into disaster psychology is humans are extremely afraid of looking foolish. Um, and if other people are not making the same decisions um, about, yes, this is a danger, uh, it's very hard for people to kind of go against the, the crowd. Um, and I see it now actually in a smaller scale level with the mask wearing, that if you go somewhere where everyone is wearing masks, then people feel that they can sort of overcome their self-consciousness about it. But if it's more of a choice thing, you know, people look around. I can see people even going into stores sort of with their mask like this, making the decision of whether they should put it up. And, um, and that's just something that is really hardwired in us. And I think a lot of what educators about various kinds of disasters, whether it's the climate crisis or with the pandemic are doing is trying to, to overcome that kind of normalcy bias where people are saying, it's probably fine. Everyone's acting like it's fine, so it must be fine. Yeah, exactly. And you can't overreact to things that, that, that are that massive and potentially catastrophic anyway. There's, there's no way, there's no, there's, you can't overreact to it. You, you have to react. Um, this, Lizzie's husband says to her at one point um, that she's become a crazy doomster in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of often quite comic moments where you talk about prepper culture, which we mentioned a moment ago. Um, did, how much research did you do and have you co-opted co any kind of skills from that sort of world. I mean, I think I, I think in a doomsday, I'd be, I'd be the first per person to be eaten. I have no skills oh, at all. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping my doomsday library will like <laughs> buy me an extra week where I could be like, look, I know, I, I know what to do with dandelions and, and here's how to turn poppies into opium. I'm hoping that that will buy me, you know, at least a, a few, uh, a few spoonfuls of gruel, but no, I'm useless. I'm very incompetent in every way. Um, but I think that, uh, Prepper culture is, is really interesting um, because I think in some ways it just speaks to almost our first impulse. Our first impulse when we learn about disaster and threat is to kind of circle the wagons, to think of our own selves and our own family and our own friends and, and kind of feel like um, we have to be afraid of the rest of the world. And I mean, I think we see that in a very sinister form in the way it's playing out in certain forms of 
um, of populist and nationalistic kind of behavior in different nations, which I think is partly because of people's fears, conscious or unconscious of climate change. But I also think that um, that's actually not how humans have survived. Humans have survived um, all these years through um, collective action, through mutual aid. Um, and that to me is one of the, the very few bright spots about this terrifying pandemic is like the mutual aid societies that have sprung up all over the world and the sort of sense of maybe this person isn't a stranger, maybe this person is my neighbor. Um, in the recent uh, civil protests in the US, there was, um, as I, you probably saw in the news, there was a moment where our, our president uh, chose to you know, tear gas uh, protesters so that he could have a photo op to a church. And later some of them um, were also tear gassed as they were trying to um, protest another area. And some, a man just opened his door and let in a hundred protesters um, and kept them there, fed them from the police. And I, I feel sort of like there's these, these examples of mutual aid. They may be very small, buying groceries for your neighbor, um, helping rebuild after a flood. And then there's these, these sort of habits of mind that I can only hope we're all trying to develop. Yeah, I mean, if that humanity is not there, things are going to come to an end a, a lot quicker. Um, one of the most chilling lines in the entire book for me was the line, um, how will the last generation know that it is the last generation? And obviously there's there's a lot of fear in this book. The characters, are, Lizzie is particularly fearful because she's a parent as well of a young child. Um, did the book, because obviously we all feel frightened about these issues, did, did the book become sort of a place for you to contain you know, some of your own fears. Um, and I also, I, I don't personally believe in catharsis, but did the book, did this book, writing this book make you feel any better? And did we able to kind of go, okay, I can put a lot of my fear into this book and it helps me address or look at it from a different angle? Um, yeah, I don't know if I believe in catharsis either, but it certainly did contain, it, it became a container, I think, for um, not only my anxieties about um, what was going to happen to myself and my daughter and, the wider world, but also um, as a sort of someone who puts ridiculous um, faith in, in research and learning and knowledge, it became kind of a, a little library of, um, of, of yes, prepping facts about, oh, here's how to turn a can of oil tuna fish into a lamp, but also how have people in other terrible times, what have they done um, that has helped them um, hold it together and, and keep their morale up and also move forward. So it also became kind of a repository for ideas about like um, spiritual and physical and um, emotional prepping. Um, and so I think I thought of it in, in the early stages as kind of a, a book for my daughter. Um, and then um, I guess the more I got into it, the more I became interested in circles of care that were much larger than, than really my own maybe as the small place I started. One of the, the circles of terror, we, we talked about this at the very end of the book and it doesn't give anything away. To, it's not a spoiler. It, it's not, it doesn't affect the, the story or you don't know the, the actual outcome, but there is a suggestion that the book is possibly set after uh, the next election in, in the US. So how, how do you write an ending for something like that after with everything that's happened? And again, this was a different book and now we're looking at it in the context of a different time. How yeah. do you, how do you do that? Well, I, I did want to do that. I did want to set it um, after what will be the November um, elections here, um, uh, presidential elections. And so it is, it, there's a scene towards the end where um, Lizzie has voted and she's out on the street with other people and they're sort of milling around. And earlier she's explained that, that disaster psychologists use this term milling um, it, to talk about the way people sort of wander around when they're trying to decide if something is a disaster or not. Um, the way that it shows up is like often people will, like if they're in an office building that's on fire, they're, they're straightening their desks, they're, they're getting all these extra things. And, and it goes back a little bit to this thing we were talking about earlier, this normalcy bias. Um, as long as you're milling, you're still in the old time in the before time is I noticed it with the pandemic too, as long as people kept popping out to get one last thing, it was as if the world hadn't, you know, gone up in flames yet. Um, and so um, it was, 
just technically very difficult to figure out how to write something that went into the future. This is, I guess, why I'm not an apocalyptic novelist. But I wanted to write uh, an ending that allowed for um, the possibility that that whatever the result of the election, there would be great unrest. Um, America is a culture of, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of gun owners. And um, many people have, have threatened that, you know, Trump will stay in office no matter what. And so I wanted to have an ending um, where the narrator is hearing a sound and she doesn't know whether it's, you know, walnuts on the roof or gunshots. Um, and that's kind of one of the near end points where that she hears these things and it could be either. Um, Lately, I'm, I'm leaning more towards gunshots, but, but sometimes it feels like it's, it's walnuts. We still have a hope. For sure. Um, I want to talk a little bit about other uh, ideas and themes in the book. Um, one of the reasons why Lizzie is in the library is that she sort of gave up on her own graduate degree because she looks after her brother who is an addict and there's the whole, there's a very tender portrayal of their relationship that she is, oh, she puts him before herself and her own family sometimes. Um, uh, and there's a, a moment where I think you talk about both addiction, but you talk about um, habituation. Um, what is the difference between the two and why did you want to write about those things? Mm. Um, well, I was interested in, in this idea, I think of the psychological term is enmeshment. Um, and it's basically this idea that you are so involved with someone, usually someone in your family, that um, you feel whatever they're feeling, that you can't have a separation um, between that. And I was interested in that, in that word because um, it also gets used in environmental circles. Um, we hear a lot about the web of life, but there's also ideas of, of the sort of um, mesh, the mesh that is connecting us all and connecting us to other living things. And um, in the psychological version of things, enmeshment is considered uh, a problem. It's considered a sign that uh, you haven't you know, done the work you're supposed to do. But I think that's a very, um, it's very much a Western idea. Um, a lot of societies that are more collective would not think that being as interconnected with um, those that are close to you matters um, in the same way. In terms of addicted and habituated, I was thinking about um, how, in my experience, being friends with or close to um, people that are struggling with addiction, there can be a kind of feeling of like eternal return, like you're almost out and then there's a relapse and you go back around again. And I feel like trying to stay with the person, stay with the trouble, um, some part of it to me feels useful as, as um, a psychological strategy for other disasters that we all want these linear paths out. We, always, we all want these silver bullet solutions. But actually, I think there's a lot of things that we bring care to that the care doesn't pay off at first. It seems like it's, it hasn't done anything, but there is in fact incremental movement. So it was just important to me to show that kind of caretaking and I wanted to show it not just in a parental way, but in a different environment. It, it's funny, there's a, there's a line from Department of Speculation um, that, that says that the reason to have a home is to keep certain people in and everyone else out. A home has a perimeter. And Department of Speculation to me feels like a much more interior book. It's based on a marriage and a home and a, and a woman who's struggling with being at home with the parent when she wants to be a, a writer. Whereas this book looks much more outwards. And was that a, a conscious decision before you started writing it that you didn't want, you wanted to, look outwards at the world and, and not be in that very small confined space of the home? Um, it was, it was a conscious decision. I mean, I, I, I think it was for many reasons. I couldn't figure out how to write. I knew that I did want to write about uh, climate and I didn't know how to do that without a book that faced outward towards um, all of the people and in fact, like non-human creatures that she comes across um, because I felt like that kind of sense of like, where are those moments where we feel these kind of flickers of fellow feeling for others? Um, you know, she actually does have a moment like that with a fly that's in her house, but in general, I feel like she had to go out on the streets a little bit for that. Um, and part of it was just that sort of um, contrarian uh, writer thing where you know that you've, you've been, you know, you've gotten all those reviews that are like, oh my gosh, could this person be any more solipsistic? Could you, and I was like, look at me writing about the world. <laughs> You know, perhaps badly, but I will try. 
um, I think what, one of the lines that stood out for a lot of people, um, and it's one of the major themes of Department of Speculation, and Lizzie is a parent to, in, in this book, but she has different concerns to, the, to the, the character of the wife in Department of Speculation. And it's the line that is, um, women almost never become art monsters because art monsters only concern themselves with art, never mundane things. And parenthesis is obviously implying parenthood it's, at some points anyway. Um, is that a view that you share, have experienced, and do you think it has changed for, for women who write and women in, in the arts, the idea that you, you can't you can't be both? Um, well, I mean, I get asked a lot if I'm an art monster. And of course, um, you know, the answer is always very disappointing that I'm like sort of an art monster from like nine till 2.30 and then I have to do school pickup. Um, but I feel like um, the idea of the art monster was sort of, um, it was meant in some ways to be very much about a youthful idea she had an idea that there was, that, that there had to be this kind of relentlessness, this kind of um, fierceness about making art um, that didn't really allow for um, what seemed to her like a softer, um, more diffuse thing, like, like continued caretaking. Um, I mean, I personally feel like this is the question that it may particularly, um, be something that that mothers who are artists or writers think about but i feel like it's it's broader than that i feel like most of us take care of someone or something in our lives and the question of when can you kind of retreat and be only in your own head to you know in my case make up imaginary things it, it often feels like um you know i used to joke when i was writing this book i would I would say after I'd been shut in my room all day, I'd, I'd come out and I'd say to my husband, oh, well, I'm so glad that I solved climate change by writing my slim experimental novel <laughs> today. Um, there's a feeling of course, uh, of sort of, uh, that it can be quite ridiculous, you know, uh, that it's not an engagement with the world. But I don't really believe that. I feel like each of us engages with the questions that matter to us in different ways. And, and for me, it's always gonna be through art. Um, and my hope almost now I think is, is 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 to use art to make myself you know less monstrous um more able to to allow for different registers of feeling and not just one the um in the in the same book there was again a, a line that sort of made me both sad and made me laugh out loud which is the character meets an editor that she used to know and he says uh did i miss your your second book and she says um uh, he said, did, did something happen? And she just says very quietly, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And your first book uh, and Department of Regulation, there was, there's, there was a 15 year gap between those two two books. Thankfully, we haven't had to wait as long for this book. Um, was there a point, and obviously you were publishing children's books in that time frame. I just mean your, your adult work. Was there a point where you thought, I'm never gonna write another book again? I sort of think that with every book. Um, I, I... I'm, I'm really a, a hair puller and teeth gnasher and, and generally very tedious about my fears that it's all over and I'll never do it again. Um, but I, I am in some way assisted by the fact that I am very much a one trick pony. I don't really have other skills of any sort. So the persistence that allows me to kind of um, keep with something for, for 15 years or 10 years or seven years in this case um, is, is partly just that it's, um, it's it's what I do and it's how I it's how I think and it's how I organize um, it's how I organize my sort of emotional life so um, sometimes a book will change a lot over the years um, uh, department came out of a book another failed book that I ended up just taking like a hundred lines from and starting over um, so sometimes there's quite a bit of metamorphosis in it but um, but it, it's just, it's something I return to because it, it just, it matters to me. And, and um, I think if I had some fantastic other skill, I might, I might've gone off and done that, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't have it. Um, one of the things that I, I, I admired about it, and I, I had seen work like that before, but I know a lot of people, it was their first time reading a book that you would describe as quite fragmentary, um, a book that had a lot of white space around it. Um, and I'm a big fan of fragments. I think you can do so, so much with them. Um, and I think that there's, do you feel that 
they, what, what do they offer? Is it possibility? Is it more space for the reader to move in? Is it that, that sense of pause, a physical pause before you move on to the next thing? What do you think that that form of writing um, does or achieves for you as a writer? Um, I mean, I think, I think all of those things that you said um, are, are useful things. I mean, I always think of that T.S. Eliot line, these fragments I have shored against my ruin. Um, there's a way in which I think when um, a moment in time or an experience seems like it is broken apart, um, that there's something um, that is both useful and kind of contemplative, the collecting of the fragments and seeing what's still there. Um, in department especially, I had a very, uh, very kind of manic narrator who's sort of galloping along. Um, and I really felt like I wanted to have the white space as both a place where the reader could kind of pause. Um, and also in a sort of more, more mystical way, I'm really interested in the idea of, um, of that we may not, that our distinctions about what's trivial and what's not um, may not hold. And so I like the idea of putting things that are seemingly trivial domestic moments on the same page as these moments that are about obviously um, someone thinking about uh, a great artist or a moment of philosophy or something like that. Because I actually feel like uh, thousands of years of religious traditions tell us that maybe, um, maybe those things can cross places much more easily than we think. So that was the other sort of formal idea of it. Um, and I feel like, um, I, you know, I've just always been a fan. It's a very common form in European writing. Um, I've always just been a fan of fragmentary and kind of collage based novels. I feel a little bit guilty when people sort of seem to believe, especially in the American press that I've invented this form, which has been around for many, many years. And no amount of my mentioning that seems to make it into the press. So uh, I apologize for all, the, all of those of you who are like, oh, good Lord, enough with the enough with the fragmentary novel you know, springing from her head. There's um there's a great line that I, I think it was your your agent described um Department of Speculation as an X-ray rather than a novel. And I, I this book is is not an X-ray. And I'm wondering, do you think how do you describe it? Do you think of it as a visual thing, this this book? Um well I'm really not allowed to describe any of my novel <laughs> to anyone by uh by anyone like my agent or my editor because I do such a, a terrible job of it. Um, you know, whatever is the equivalent of, I think they, in Hollywood, they call it the elevator pitch, where you have some little three line thing that you say, I've never been good at that. Even, even, even books that are 10 years old, I still can't manage it very well. Um, so I think, um, I think what I think of with, with the book is, I, I think sort of in a very basic sense, I mean, I, I, think, I think of the emotional tenor of a book when I describe it. So Department of Speculation is a book of, about loneliness and, and Weather is a book about dread. And, um, and Weather is also a book uh, that fumbles towards an idea of, of grace or of, um, of some kind of possible exhilaration after coming through the dread. <laughs> Um, people can go to the, the, the website um, obligatorynoteofhope.com that you mentioned in the book, which is sort of tips and reading and quotes. Um, but there's a moment where you kind of, you, you, you turn the sort of, you, you turn a question on yourself where you say, how could a meat eating, plane flying, March hating person like me ever find a place in the climate justice movement? But, but you did. And I'm wondering for people who feel like that, who feel that they can't find a place within it, what, what can they do to maybe change their own minds about that feeling? Well, I think, um, you know, in, in, in Buddhist thought, there's like different schools of enlightenment, you know, and one is basically the sudden school and one is the gradual school. And I think, um, I think most of us are always hoping to be in the sudden school, you know, where, where the scales fall off your eyes and you, and you figure out how to live. And, um, but I, for one, never seem to manage that. I'm always um, sort of plodding along with whatever I, I come to believe. And, you know, for me, the, the, the most helpful thing was that I just at a certain point decided that I believed in activism for hypocrites. And I, I just, I'm, I'm very much a hypocrite. And, and yet these seven years or so where I've been thinking a lot and seriously trying to um, find my way in the movement, um, 
it has it has made changes in me. Um, they may not be the changes that other people think I should have made, but um, but I know that uh, I know that it's something that I went from never really thinking about to thinking about every day, and um, and so I feel like to me, I probably would have come to activism sooner if I didn't feel like there was a perfect litmus test that you had to pass. Um, and in some ways, that's why I think Paul Kingsnorth was an interesting um, o opening door for me, like to see someone walk away who was a famous environmentalist and say, no, I don't, I, I can't follow that anymore. Um, I'm always drawn to, I'm not much of a group person and I'm not much of a um, orthodox kind of person. So I feel like it's been a process of trying to figure out um, how can I be of use? And, you know, like you, I, I would not be, I would not last long at the doomstead. Um, but, but at least um, I think all of us can take whatever it is that we do that's necessary and, and, and try to put it towards causes that we believe in. I, I, I completely agree. Um, I'm aware that there's a lot of questions and I could keep asking you questions, but we'd be here all night. So I'm going to uh, just have a look. Um, people have been sending us questions in. So here is one first one for you, Jenny. Uh, it's from Hugh. Uh, weather is formally similar to department speculation. With department, those short segments spoke strongly about the narrator's fragmenting life and identity. Could you talk about how and why you chose a similar style for weather? Um, I think I chose a similar style because it felt to me with department like I had found a style that was closer to the way I think and the way that um, I sort of have associative trains of thought than the way I had written my um, first more linear, more conventional novel, Last Things, um, which incidentally sort of covered some of the same ideas and is mostly about extinction. Um, so I think it was a little bit of a feeling of uh, just being comfortable in the new style that I'd found. But I also wanted to kind of push the, the perimeters of it. I didn't want it to be a style that could only handle intense interiority. I wanted it to be a style that could also um, ideally um, take in sort of like glancing blows from the world and glancing moments um, of thought and feeling. And so I kept the fragmentariness um, because I felt like uh, that was the way that things still were affecting her. In the beginning of the novel, I think of, I think of her as very much in kind of a state of like twilight knowing, like she knows of course about the climate, um, but she doesn't look directly at it. And I wanted to have a form that would allow that kind of um, in-betweenness and that when she did learn, it wasn't sudden, sudden it was gradual. Thank you. Sorry, that question was from Valerie O'Reard and something got truncated there. Um, there's a question, it's somebody who hasn't left their name. Um, Zen Buddhism features in the book. Why did you include this as a framework for dealing emotionally with the climate crisis? Um, well, I was raised uh, Christian and it wasn't till I was in college that I encountered um, really any kind of Buddhist thought. And I remember when I first did, I was sort of stunned by how um, sort of uncomforting it was. Um, I thought to myself, you know, with certain versions of Christian thought, there's this idea, you know, oh, there's an all powerful father and he really wants you to, to do right. And, and he's here for you. And, and his son's also going to like help you out. And his son's kind of hot and like better to like, think about than, than the father, but et cetera, et cetera. And with Buddhism, I felt like it just kept collapsing all the certainties and all the um, ideas. And it kept um, returning to this idea of, of impermanence and, and change and, and flow. And it took me a lot of years to feel more comfortable with that idea. I think as I grew older, um, I started to feel like most of the things that we hope for in terms of security are really built on on shaky ground and Buddhist thought became more and more influential to me. Um, but I'm not I'm not really a proper Buddhist. I'm, I'm sort of a, a Buddhist adjacent. <laughs> I would say. 
Um, this is a couple of people's questions overlapped. So just for time reasons, we sort of put them together. It's from Gronia, Paul and Samantha. Um, are you feeling optimistic about the climate movement today? And do you think that optimism comes with age? Mm. <clears throat> That's an interesting question. Does optimism come with age? Um, I feel cautiously optimistic, I would say. Um, I feel like it's happened in absolutely terrible circumstances, but we've had this sort of social experiment of what does it mean when things are shut down? What does it mean when you're forced to live with constraints, live more locally, live more closely? Um, and I think the very difficult work once we get to the other side of this public health crisis is, is there anything from that that we can, that we can take? Um, I mean, I know I was about to come to the UK for my book tour and I was um, in my hypocrite way flying around a lot talking about this climate change book. And, you know, suddenly I haven't gone anywhere more than five miles from my house in, in, uh, in 80 days. And I feel like um, there's been so much uh, brutality and heartache and loss that I don't think there's really any way to take in any of that yet. But I do feel like I feel optimistic at the expressions of um, collectivism that I've seen, um, both with people coming together right now in America, um, and I think also in the UK, uh, fighting against police brutality, um, and also with some of the mutual aid that sprung up around the pandemic. I feel like the idea of the collective and the idea of like not just thinking of yourself as an individual is more ascendant than it has been in a very long time. And since climate change is a collective problem, I don't think that it has individual or consumer solutions. I think it has collective solutions. Thank you. Our next question is from Tom, who asks, do you see any connection between COVID-19 and ecosystem destruction? Uh, I mean, yes, very much so. I mean, I, I think that uh, we don't know the precise details of how um, how it moved from um, the animal world into the human world. Um, I mean, we're animals too, but you know what I mean. Um, we don't know that, but certainly uh, habitat destruction um, is one of the ways that that these um, these viruses are, are crossing over and um, not allowing enough space for animals to have the habitats they need um, puts us at more and more danger with this. Also, I think the degree to which, I mean, it's been very interesting because I feel like we talk about interconnectedness a lot in the environmental movement and it's almost always, um, you know, it's, it's, it's usually kind of a, a beautiful thing, a sublime thing. Um, and then with COVID-19, we have this very kind of, um, sinister manifestation of it where every single thing um, could hurt every other thing. And if you went into the grocery store, um, you thought about every element of, of where that thing came from. And I think actually that kind of systems thinking is really good for all of us to do. Um, it was strange to have it come so clear in such a dark context, but no, I don't think they're unrelated. Um, and Unfortunately, the science suggests that we're going to have more of these um, kind of epidemics and that um, certainly the pandemic has shown um, in most places a lack of resilience, a lack of um, robust systems of care, um, which I think is a similar problem that we're facing with the climate crisis. For sure. Um, quite a big question, this one. It's from Michael, who asks, there's a school of thought that says that empires have their time and that the USA is reaching the end of its time. Does this feel real to you? Yes. I think it feels like the end of an empire. I think it's felt that way for... Uh, it's felt this way in fits and starts for a long time, um, since 9-11, for sure. But, um, but ever since... Um, ever since Trump was elected and we've had a, a, a really sort of um, impressively systematic dismantling of, of what we think of as um, kind of pillar stones of our country. I mean, I remember, um, I'm no you know, huge America booster, but when, when he first started um, 
trying to put all these draconian um, immigration uh, stops on immigration. I mean, I, I felt sort of like that was one thing I was just very, very proud of about where I come from. Like, I really felt like uh, the immigrant culture in America is a really a beautiful and amazing thing. And I've had the, um, the good fortune to, to teach lots of students and, and know lots of people that um, were not born here, but became Americans. And when that went away, um, I just felt like it was kind of the, it felt like it was really, um, it, was a, it was a crumbling blow. And of course, uh, the violence that's going on right now feels like um, more of that sense of collapse. I mean, most of the people I know who are kind of in environmental circles and talk about collapse, they're all writing to each other saying like, oh, things are collapsing. I thought we had a little longer, <laughs> but I think maybe not, <laughs> so. And um, do you think he's gonna get reelected? God, I hope not. Um, I certainly hope not. I mean, I, if there's a free and fair election, which I don't know is a given, uh, I think there's a good chance he won't be. Yeah. Um, but it's really all bets are off. I mean, one of the most disturbing things about the last few years is, is to realize how many things that I think um, I sort of idly thought were actually um, laws were more or less just like a, a gentleman's handshake. Like, you know, oh, we've always had press conferences and known what's going on in the White House. And it's like, oh, I guess you just don't have to do that if you don't want to. Or the federal government doesn't have to organize responses when there's a disaster that affects all the states. So there's been a lot of um, a sort of sense of, um, you know, it goes back to that normalcy bias. Um, frankly, a lot of people, m predominantly women, uh, commentators and, and commentators who are people of color have been saying from the very beginning, he's dismantling the country, he's selling it for parts. But I think a lot of us were too slow to realize uh, the extent of it. Sure. Um, this looks like it might be our, our final question. Um, the book talks about family relationships in the context of climate change. Could you say more about the close relationships as a place where difficult conversations, but also necessary change happen around these issues? That's from Katrina. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, well, I think a lot about this thing that, um, that the philosopher Donna Haraway said, and she was talking about um, how it's important in thinking about, I think she was specifically talking about climate change, but in, in general, um, all sorts of systemic problems that it's important to stay with the trouble, to not, to not sort of become so overwhelmed that you throw up your hands and you walk away. And I, I do, I did come to feel writing this book that uh, fatalism is, is its own form of denialism. Um, it may not be the kind where you're saying climate change doesn't exist, but I think it's, um, it's still a form. And so one of the things I think about family life is that um, you do have to stay with the trouble. There's all sorts of moments where family life isn't going the way you might hope or where people are at odds or where some, um, unsuspected disaster has come up. And the part where you've sort of committed, um, and that may be a blood bond, or that may be a marital bond, or it may be a chosen family bond, but um, you're supposed to stay. And I think that part of, of staying with the trouble for me really carries over into my own thoughts about like activism. Um, because we started a little bit late, I think we can cheat a little bit with the time. So, because there's an, a question I've just spotted that's quite interesting from uh, Fergal, who asks, women leaders and economists seem better at addressing the big issues of the pandemic and climate change. Any thoughts on why that might be? Hmm. I don't know, but I sure want to move to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think that, um, well, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard to make sweeping statements about it that are, are gendered, but you know, that said, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do that. Um, I think that maybe for many women, um, the idea of, of sacrificing for the good of others, of putting um, someone else's um, concern about their welfare ahead of maybe perhaps even what you wish to do or want to do, um, is, is something that societally we've been taught and that we're maybe more prone to. And so I think when these, when these moments come up, um, 
I mean, I still sort of to this day, I'm a little bit amazed if I go out at the, um, at the difference between how many men and how many women are wearing masks <laughs> in, in a public setting. I mean, I just keep seeing that again and again. And I, 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 don't, I don't know for sure what that's about, but I do feel like um, that sense of I'm here to help you and, and I expect that that help will not make me weaker, but make me, make me stronger, make me part of a intermeshed um, alliance, I think may come a little more easily to, to women, but I certainly know so many men also that um, really subscribe to those values and, and live up to them that I, I'm not sure I can, I can completely make it a gendered observation. A final question um, is, I'm always interested to know what people are working on next. And I know this is a very difficult time to, to be writing. I'm finding it hard myself. Um, are you working on a new book? Um, I'm working a little bit, um, not very much or very well. I was already writing um, a bit about um, the strangeness of taking care of um, of older people, of um, of that those moments in time where some of that shifts, um, and then that because of course became very strange because with the pandemic, um, you know, you sort of end up locking the people who are vulnerable in your life in with a key, and, <laughs> and then you, you know you, you bring over their their food or their laundry and 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 try to keep them safe, much as often if they're parents, they tried to keep you safe all those years. Um, so I'm thinking about that, and then I'm quite. Um, in a quite silly way, I'm working on this um, short film with a friend of mine that's about um, scurvy and about uh, two people overwintering in um, Antarctica in a ship. And all of it was done and written before any of this. And now that I have more experience with um, isolation, uh, cooped up madness and contagion, I'm much more interested in going back and, and, and redoing that. So that's the other thing I'm working on. That sounds excellent. Um, I will, we're going to hand back to Oshin Cockle in a moment, but I just want to say thank you so much to Friends of the Earth for organising this. Thank you, Jenny, for giving up your time. Uh, Jenny's book, Weather, is published in the UK and Ireland by Granta. You should go out and buy it. Also have a look at the website, obligatorynoteofhope.com. And the last thing I'll have to say to you, Jenny, is may you be among the survivors. <laughs> may you be among the survivors. <laughs> thank you so much. This was wonderful. And thank thanks you. so much for having me. Happy uh, World Environmental Day, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jenny and Sinead. Um, my role this evening, and I'm Ashin Coughlin, I'm the director of Friends of the Earth, was is primarily to say thank yous and to say a, a few words about Friends of the Earth and why we did this and what's next. But I, so I first want to say I could easily have listened to the two of you speak for another hour or two. It was fun, it was really a rich and, and fascinating conversation, and it it, it really re rewarded us for for uh, deciding to do this. It's not something we haven't done something quite like this before. I just read an interview uh, with you, Jenny, in the Irish Times in February, and thought, oh, I want to read this book first of all, and wow, I wonder what our supporters like it. What could it say to us about? about what we're what we're involved in because you know we're a campaigning organization day to day we're emailing politicians we're organizing protests uh, we're organizing educational events and we'd felt particularly actually in the context of the pandemic that we could do other things to connect ourselves and to take uh, a step back to take a, a, a break from the campaigning we're in the middle of a government formation process here which is going on forever as long as the pandemic uh, and this was a chance to step back and deepen our uh, our engagement and our and our, and our uh, our, our engagement with the issues that, that we that we deal with, and I'm so I'm so delighted we did. For me, uh, I was saying this to you before we came on. Uh, the book, what's really struck me about the book was that juxtaposition between the growing dread of, of uh, based on a growing awareness of of climate breakdown, juxtaposed with the everyday distractions and trials and tribulations and delights of, of everyday life. And and that for those of us who work in climate change, that that really resonated with me. Something that you, that struck me from what you said. Uh, was about how you wrote the book to to write your way into feeling about about uh, feeling climate change, and interesting that, that uh, reading it it did that for me, which I'm grateful for, but also slightly alarmed by because actually, <laughs> as someone who works on it every day, I kind of try to compartmentalize it to some degree, or else you would burn out uh, very very quickly. And the book broke down some of those walls for me. I was struck by something you said there as well. You you mentioned or Shane brought up um, a dark mountain and. Those as in NGOs are in the activist movement have obviously have mixed feelings about about uh, that kind of of 
dark retreat, potentially. Um, I, you did say then later on um, that uh, fatalism is its own form of denial. And certainly it struck me, I wanted, to, I wanted to, um, to abuse my position to share a couple of lines from an article that I keep going back to when I am feeling fatalistic or, uh, or not sure what, whether there's any hope left. Uh, and it's by an American writer called David Roberts, who wrote, used to write for grist.org and now oh, writes right. for vox.com. And he's a, he's a writer on environmental and energy policies. So that's what he does. But he also does a lot of, about communications. And there's a few lines from, from that that I want to share with people before we go. Uh, so he, he, it's responding to a question he says he's always asked is, is there any hope or are we just effed? And at the end of that article, he goes through optimism versus hope and, and, the, and the actual science. And at the end, he says, Remember, there is no too late here, no game over. It'll be a tragedy to shoot past two degrees to three, but four is worse than three and five is worse than four. Being unprepared for any of those would, would be much worse than being prepared. The future always forks, forks. There are always better and worse paths ahead. There's always a difference to be made. When we ask for hope then, I think we're just asking for fellowship. The weight of climate change, like any weight, is easier to bear with others. And if there's anything I've learned in these last 10 years, it's that there are many, many others. They are out there, men and women of extraordinary imagination, courage and perseverance, pouring themselves into this fight for a better future. You are not alone. And as long as you are not alone, there is always hope. So I, I use that as my, as my um, crutch uh, when, when things get, get tough. Uh, now, Friends of the Earth, I don't know if we can describe ourselves as a fellowship, but we certainly try to build a community in, in the heart of the climate movement where, where people can stand together and face the future and engage that future and try to make it a, a better one. And most people here will know, but maybe some of them don't. If you sign up on, uh, on our website, uh, foe.ie, you will hear about the obvious things you can do, like emailing politicians, ringing politicians, joining local groups, which are obviously online at the moment, uh, to, to do that more effectively. There's also lots of educational opportunities uh, and courses we run now again online. And weirdly, moving online as we did suddenly, very suddenly and very completely eight weeks ago, has actually, while putting, you know, placing all the staff in our in our homes connected us in a way we haven't before. Every event we now do is not in a room in Dublin or a room in some other part of Ireland. It's open to everybody in Ireland and beyond. So we suddenly have an event that might have had 40 people in it before has 100 or 200. So actually we have we've used this to try to build uh, uh, that community and to share and connect with the rest of the movement. We're very conscious that we're only one small part of the movement. It's been amazing to watch Extinction Rebellion and the school strikes in particular arrive over the last year or two. It's like the cavalry arriving, uh, although we don't, want to put, we don't want to put too many expectations, particularly on the young people. It's up to us as our generation who screwed it up to, to, to bear the weight of fixing it. But it has been amazing to stand with them and support them. And so uh, we hope that those of you who are here this evening will, if you are, if you are already engaged, will stay engaged. And next week we'll be back to bothering politicians to form a, a, a government with, with a real strong climate, climate agenda. And if you're new to Friends of the Earth to uh, to connect with us more and stay engaged. We hope we may well run more uh, more events like this. And I'm really, really grateful to you, Sinead, for, for doing this for us because it's you, you've got you, you've brought so much to it and got so much out of it that we wouldn't have been able to do. You, you brought your skill set so wonderfully. And Jenny, thank you so much for sharing your work and your, your mind with us this evening uh, and your grace. And uh, we're, we're very grateful. And thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.